exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. I was born and raised in Louisiana. And the only thing that you need to know about Louisiana is that we have nothing to be proud of. Like, our economy is terrible. School is terrible. The government is a mess. I actually remember going on a mission trip to the third world impoverished country of Honduras. And after I came back from that mission trip, I learned that the life expectancy in Louisiana was lower than in Honduras. And... And so when I say that we have nothing to be proud of, I mean we have absolutely nothing to be proud of except for LSU football. So the Louisiana State Fighting Tigers were like the one thing that would bring the community together and give us a sense of pride. It would give us something to look forward to. And so I remember the year that LSU won the national championship is back in 2003 for the first time in over 40 years under head coach Nick Saban. And it felt like we're finally the best at something. We're not the worst. We're finally the best. The only problem was that Nick Saban would leave LSU to go coach in the pros. And when that didn't work out, he would become the head coach at rival team Alabama, where he would eventually win six national championships. And y'all, I've never seen someone go from the most beloved figure in an area to the most hated and figure so quickly like we would unironically call him nick satan and and i remember when the movie the blind side y'all remember that movie with sandra bullock when that came out nick saban had a cameo and when he came on the screen i remember everyone in the theater booed audibly and loudly And, and so i say all this to tell you that it pains me to use Nick Saban as a good example for anything. So so even though it hurts my soul a little bit, I want to quote Nick Saban. Um, Let me tell you what Nick Saban has to say about what he calls the process. Nick Saban says, ignore the scoreboards. Don't worry about winning. Just focus on doing your job at the highest level every single play. Now that is deeply profound wisdom. But it's insanely hard to put into practice because especially in football, how can you not look at the scoreboard? I mean, I mean, the goal is to get more points than the other guys, right? But I think the wisdom in this, of course, it's so easy to get focused on the score that you begin to panic and to second guess yourself. Or maybe even if you're ahead, you, you relax and so you don't push as hard. And that's when you start to make mistakes. And so I want to ask you a question, church. What is our goal? What is our ultimate goal as a church? What does it look like for us to win? And let me suggest one goal that most church people think should be and is our top goal, like conversions, right? I think most people would think that our number one goal is to see people come to Christ, and that's a good goal. Like, we want that. But if that's our goal, then we're losing pretty bad as a church. I became a Christian in the Southern Baptist Uh, in a Southern Baptist church, and I got trained at a Southern Baptist college, and something I would hear Southern Baptists say all the time is, it's all worth it if just one person comes to know the Lord. And that's a nice saying, and and I appreciate what they're trying to do, say, you don't need a thousand people, just just need one. But that saying would kind of haunt me this this past winter, especially next Sunday is going to be my three years as the pastor here, and I haven't seen a single person that I know of, come to the Lord. And so, yeah, if even one person came to the Lord, it'd be great. But what happens if no one comes? And, and that reality led me down a kind of spiritual depression and had me thinking, Lord, why did you call me here? Am I supposed to be here? Am I even supposed to be a pastor? Because, because if our goal is conversions and to see people come to Christ, then we're not doing so hot. But what if our ultimate goal is not conversions? What if our ultimate goal isn't more baptisms or more members or more people showing up every Sunday? Like, I think those are good and godly. Like, there's a a godly discontent in wanting more people to be in the church. But I don't think those are our ultimate goals. I think there's a much more foundational goal that underlies all of those. What is that goal? Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. 
If you're using a pew Bible, Exodus 5 is on page 56. And as you're turning, let me tell you that Moses had a literal mountaintop experience with God where God audibly and clearly said to Moses to, to go on his behalf to set the Israelites free from their slavery. At the end of chapter four, Moses went to the elders of Israel. He told them what God was going to do. And not only did they believe Moses, but before God had done a single thing, while they were still slaves in Egypt, the people bowed their heads in worship. Like, like th this was a mountaintop experience for the people. It's time to, to get freed from our slavery. The Lord's gonna do something. But now in chapter five, Things are going to get way worse before they get any better. And the Israelites are going to get hung up on the scoreboard rather than trusting the process. And my prayer for us this morning is that we as God's people would be able to trust in God's promises, even when by all appearances, it seems like we're losing. Because in Exodus 5, we're going to find four responses, four responses. First, in verses 1 through 19, Pharaoh will respond in pride. Second, in verses 20 through 21, the people will respond by complaining. Third, in verses 22 through 23, Moses will respond with lament. And fourth, we're actually going to go a little bit into chapter six. The Lord will respond by repeating his promises. So let's pray and then we'll, we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, we know that you called us to take up our own crosses to follow your son. But, oh Lord, some... Some weeks, the burden just feels too heavy. So this morning, we ask you to lighten the load like only you could. And Lord, as, as the word is preached this morning, may, may the sermon that is heard be far better than the one that is delivered by the power of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at me to verse 1. <laughs> Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. This question that Pharaoh raises in verse 2 is what the rest of Exodus is all about. Who is the Lord? Well, Pharaoh, you're about to find out. And when you think about it, it's not surprising at all that Pharaoh doesn't know who Yahweh is because why would Pharaoh care about the God of these immigrant slaves that are working for him? Like, can you imagine someone, someone going up to President Biden and making these kinds of commands? President Biden, my God is telling you to do this policy. I mean, that would just be insane. And, and for Pharaoh, it's not just that he happened to believe in the Egyptian gods and someone's coming to him from a different faith. Like, like if someone who is Muslim went to Biden and said, Allah says this, and Biden's like, I'm actually Catholic. And, you know, there's a whole conversation of how Catholic is he. But in this conversation, it's not just that the Pharaoh happened to believe in the Egyptian gods, but Pharaoh also believed that he was an Egyptian god. In Egypt, Pharaoh was one of was the one who was made in the image of the gods. Of all the people in Egypt, only one person is made in the image of God. It is Pharaoh. And he alone was appointed to rule Egypt as the one mediator between the gods and man. And so when Pharaoh says, who is Yahweh? Who is the Lord? It's not just that he doesn't know who Yahweh is. It's that he doesn't care. I am a higher and superior God than this one. So Moses and Aaron... They, they try to make him care in verse three. And then they, they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence, pestilence or with the sword. Now you may be wondering, why are they only asking for three days off when God's plan was to permanently free the Israelites from slavery? Well, I, I think, and I argued this a few weeks ago, I think this is a test for Pharaoh. This is a test because after 400 years of uninterrupted slavery, God is testing Pharaoh by simply asking for three days off on behalf of his people. And let's see how gracious Pharaoh is when he takes this test. Look to verse four. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? 
Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men. That they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Stop there. You know, if I was one of Pharaoh's advisors at this time, where we believe in lots of gods and maybe other countries have gods we don't know about, but we just believe our gods are more powerful. I might have said to him, Pharaoh, I mean, three days off after 400 years, like that's not that much time. And, and Pharaoh, you may not know this God, but we don't know this God. We don't know how dangerous or powerful he is that they're willing to cut us a deal. Let's just let them go sacrifice so they can appease the wrath of this God and we'll get them back after a three-day weekend. Like, like, why not Pharaoh? And I really think most of the pagan kings back, back in the day would have been like, you know what? Just to be safe, let them go. They'll be right back. But Pharaoh is so prideful and stubborn and cruel that he would not even grant them the simple request. And in verse 9, he even calls Moses a liar. And Moses is God's prophet, means that if, if he's calling Moses a liar, he's calling the Lord a liar. And, and so we, we read on in verse 10. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. This is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. Stop there. I will just be the first to admit that I have a horrible memory. I've got terrible attention span issues. I think Lois knows this more than anyone. Is She's been working as the treasurer, and Tom will find out very soon. If I don't write something down, I will forget it. And, and even if I write it down, there's a 50% chance I'm losing that piece of paper. It's, it's gone. And so most of the time, you have to tell me something two or three times before it really sticks. Please pray for Katie, y'all. So when I was reading this passage... Something did catch my attention because as, as I was just reading this over and over, I'm like, why is it repeating so much? Like the same words and the phrases over and over again. We hear the words straw, bricks, task, taskmaster over and over again. Uh, we, we hear Pharaoh's order at least three or four times in different ways rephrased, but it's the same order. Just, just This could have been said in five verses and it spans out to 20. So what is going on here? Well, remember... The Bible wasn't primarily meant to be read, but heard. And what I mean by that is throughout most of human history, most people couldn't read. And so you would go to a synagogue and someone would grab the scroll of Exodus and they'd pull it out and they would read it out loud to the whole congregation. And, and, and I think the reason why we get so many words and phrases repeated is it's, it's supposed to catch the attention of your ear. And these words and phrases are very deliberate words and phrases that only show up in one other story in the Bible. And I, and I think these words are supposed to remind you of that other story. What story is that? I think Moses wants us to think of the Tower of Babel. Because only, the only time in the entire book of Genesis the word brick shows up is in Genesis 11, where they make bricks to build the Tower of Babel. It's this very unique word that's only used... In uh, Genesis 11, it's used in Exodus 1 when the Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites, and then it's used here several times in Exodus 5. And so, um, let me see. And so, and even in verse 12, 
Uh, when it says the people were scattered to find straw, that's the exact same word used in the Tower of Babel story for when God scattered the peoples across the earth after he confused their languages. And, and, and so even though I doubt when you heard this passage read aloud that you're like Tower of Babel, I think if you were an ancient Israelite and you had heard these stories over and over, Moses wants you to make the connection that Egypt is the new Babel. That if you're an ancient Israelite, you're like, oh, Egypt is the new Babel. I got it. Why does Moses want us to think of Egypt as the new Babel? Because any nation that seeks to make a name for itself rather than a name for the Lord through oppressing and abusing the weak and the powerless is a nation that has adopted the spirit of Babel. I think that's even why when we get to the book of Revelation, we find a tale of two cities, a tale of an earthly city of Babylon the Great and the heavenly city of the new Jerusalem. Like, you know, I'll say I love America, but do not make the mistake of thinking that America has not adopted the spirit of Babylon. Because as much as I'm proud to be an American, I'm thankful that I was born here. I'm thankful for the rights that we have here. The reality is, is that we have a long history of slavery and discrimination and abuse just like in Egypt. And even today, as the weakest and most vulnerable members of our society, the unborn are slaughtered daily in their mother's womb. I think that we look a lot more like Babylon the Great than we do the New Jerusalem. And, and, and this isn't just like an American bashing session. I, I think this is true for any nation that sets itself up to make a great name for itself that will ignore the commandments of God through abuse, through harm, through oppression. And, and, and right here in this chapter, Egypt has adopted the spirit of Babylon. In the Garden of Eden, God designed man to rule over the beast, not man to rule over man. And the reason God designed designed man in the first place was not for man's own glory, but for God's glory. And in the Tower of Babel, what we saw was man seeking his own glory. And now in Exodus 5, we see Pharaoh seeking his own glory by abusing and enslaving his fellow man, his fellow divine image bearers, even though, of course, Pharaoh would deny that they're made in the image of God like He was. And now that Pharaoh has turned up the heat, the people do not respond well. Look to verse 20. There, oh, wait, let me see. Oh, there we go. Verse 20. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and put a sword in their hand to kill us. People were quick to believe Moses and Aaron in chapter four. But now in chapter five, they are quick to grumble and complain. And this will be a theme throughout the rest of the book of Exodus and the rest of the Torah. And and even though God had told Moses that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would not let them go, like he had warned them about this trouble that was coming. But at this point, they are ready to turn on Moses. They were so focused on their present circumstances that they ended up forgetting the promises that God had made to them. And instead of trusting the process, they were focused on the scoreboard and it simply led them to despair. And I think it's so easy for us to fall into the same trap because when a person decides to follow Jesus, honestly, let me tell you, their life will probably get much worse before it gets better. That's why Jesus warned us that all who follow him were going to be hated like he was and rejected like he was and even persecuted like he was. Like this week, I came across a baptism questionnaire for a church in South Asia. This is a country where it is illegal to follow Jesus. That's why we say South Asia. I'm not naming the country. And, And so they ask these questions of anyone who's interested in baptism. Listen to these questions. Are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Are you willing to lose your job? Are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you, forgive them and share the love of Christ with them? Are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Are you willing to go to prison? Are you willing to die for Jesus? Like I know when I was baptized, they were just, hey, anyone want to get baptized after camp? I was like, yes. And I think that was the right decision. I was excited to get baptized, but there was, there was no counting of the cost because of where we live. Because I, I think in America, we still have an era of cultural Christianity where, where that kind of persecution 
we at least think, doesn't apply to us. And mostly it doesn't. But Jesus did give us the warning that the world was going to hate us and reject our message and persecute us. So when you're mocked for your faith and looked down upon, let me ask you, are you tempted to grumble and complain and give up on the mission? The Israelites were certainly tempted to. Pharaoh responded in pride. The people responded by complaining. But I want you to look and see how how Moses responds in this situation. Look to verses 22 through 23. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Every time I had ever read this passage before this week, I'd always just assume that Moses was, was in the same boat as the Israelites, that, that he was disbelieving in God's promises, that he was not being faithful. I always thought that Moses was, was praying a prayer of unbelief and that he'd given up. But this week, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's, that's what this passage is saying. I think there is a crucial difference between how Moses responds to the situation and how the Israelites respond to the situation. The Israelites, when they were confronted, they complained to Moses, but Moses didn't just turn to Aaron and start grumbling. No, in this, mo- in this moment, Moses' instinct is to turn to the Lord in prayer and lament. Some of you know, not that long ago, we did a little series in the winter on prayers of lament in the Psalms. And if you remember, a lament is a prayer and pain that leads to trust. A lament is a prayer where you can honestly bring your questions and your pain to God, knowing that he is, in fact, the only one who can do anything about it. And before that series on on lament, where we really got this deep dive in the Psalms, this prayer would have felt like unbelief to me. But now that I've gotten a chance to wrestle with these kinds of prayers and and familiarize myself with with the Psalms, I, I think this prayer is actually a prayer of faith. In verse 21, it seems like the Israelites had lost faith in Moses and in God's plan. But in verse 22, even as Moses says, why have you done evil to this people? Moses, in that question, is declaring his belief in God's control over the situation. Now, Moses knows that God never does anything evil. And that's why in verse 23, he is clear that Pharaoh is the one who has done evil. But as Moses is wrestling with these questions, he's quick both to affirm God's absolute sovereignty over the situation and Pharaoh's absolute responsibility for his sinful actions. And in that last statement, you have not delivered your people at all. Why does Moses say that? Moses is calling on God to act according to the promises that God had already made. Something that would absolutely revolutionize how you pray. Somebody told me this like 20 years ago, and it still changes the way that I think about prayer. Prayer is not asking for things that you want. Prayer is primarily calling on God to act based on what he has already promised. And this is how everyone in the Bible prays. God, you have made this promise. God, please answer this promise. And, and that's why, you know, you pray for a Lamborghini and God doesn't, he hasn't promised that. Like, like there's, there's so many dumb prayers that I hear. And like, you know, you're not supposed to say that, but there's just dumb prayers that I hear sometimes around. And if we pray based on what scripture declares to us and promises us, we can know that those prayers will be answered. Not always in our time frame. They've been 400 years in slavery and the people expected day one, we're ready to go. But God's like, no, this is going to take some time. It's like we're on my timeline, not yours. But I think it's still fair in this, Moses, in, in this moment for Moses to feel conflicted. As the people hate him. They're rejecting his leadership. Again, people are getting beat even though they don't deserve to. They're, they're only doing right. They're not being beat for good reason. So, so I, I feel the emotional turmoil of Moses in verses 22 through, through 23. And, and, and so the beauty of lament is this is that when someone prays a prayer of lament, God invites us to honestly bring our questions and our emotions to him in a way that will help us to process our pain so that in the end, we can put our whole trust in him. And here Moses, notice, Moses is not just asking these questions for his own sake, but Moses is acting as a mediator for the people of Israel. 
Someone who can stand between God and man and plead for the people to God. And this is going to be one of Moses' main roles as the leader of Israel is that often when the people mess up and sin and deserve to be destroyed, Moses is going to be the one to stand up and to pray for them and to plead their case and to act as the one mediator who could do anything about it. And listen, church, this is why we need Jesus. Like, like more than the next breath in your lungs, you need someone who has access to God, who can mediate on your behalf. Because the reality of sin is that every time that we sin, we create distance between us and God because for a sinner to walk into the holy presence of God is like throwing dynamite into a fire pit. That's what we see with Nadab and Abihu and and Sapphira and Ananias. We, we, We see people who are sinful, walk into the presence of God and and he is so holy that it consumes them. And so in our sinful state, we are separated from God so much so that Isaiah 59 says that our sin hinders our prayers so that God does not hear the prayers of sinners. So unless we have a righteous mediator who can stand before us and represent us before God, we have no hope. We have no hope. That's why even our good deeds are like filthy rags before God because it doesn't matter how good you are. If you have any sin on you, you cannot access God. And so Moses plays this role for Israel. But even Moses would fail and sin. And even Moses himself would need a true and better mediator. And that's exactly why Jesus came to the earth to be the one mediator between God and man. That's why he took on flesh. Uh, Jesus was what Pharaoh wished he was in his wildest dreams. Jesus was and is God from all of eternity, but he took on flesh to be the true and ultimate image of the invisible God. He came to live a sinless life so that he could perfectly mediate on our behalf. He died on the cross to be the once and for all sacrifice to satisfy God's wrath. And then he triumphantly rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of God the Father. And let me tell you, if we get all of the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, but if he is not at the right hand of God and we have no mediator, we have no hope. We have no salvation. But Jesus ascended to the right hand of God the Father so that he could always call back to the promises that God has made to us in Christ and that his blood ever pleads for us on our behalf. That Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father as the true and better mediator for all who would believe so that now we can sing before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's the role of the mediator. That's why God doesn't get angry at Moses because in these simple verses, Moses is acting as a mediator for Israel, just like Christ will be the mediator for all who believe in him from any nation. And I think that's, that. listen to this, if Moses had asked inappropriate questions or had said anything that was false about God in verses 23 through 23, then God would have had every right to be angry like we see in Exodus, God is concerned with his glory and his namesake, and God is holy. So, so I think Moses' questions and his laments are appropriate expressions of faith. And I think that's why the Lord responds the way he does to Moses in chapter 6. Look to chapter 6, verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. I love the tension even between God's sovereignty and and Pharaoh's. I'm going to make this happen, but Pharaoh is going to be the one to send you out. Verse two, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Verse two, who is the Lord? The Lord steps up. I am. Verse three, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. So notice this. In this moment, God said, all this land is going to be yours. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob all died never having 
except a small graveyard. Like that's all they got of the promised land in their lives. So he's like, I made this covenant hundreds of years ago and I'm continuing to keep my word. Verse five, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptian hold as slaves and I have remembered my covenant. Why in Yahweh's sovereign plan did he ordain for Pharaoh to take away the straw and mock the people and mock Yahweh's name and to beat their leaders? God doesn't tell us why. Like, like in this response, you notice God did not answer Moses' question. But, but I, I think even like, you know, we saw that eclipse a few months ago where, where, where the moon overtook the, the sun in this glorious display and let me ask, in that eclipse, did the sun stop existing? No. No. It's, it simply got overshadowed by a greater reality. And in this passage, Moses' questions don't get answered and they don't go away, but they do get eclipsed by the reality of who God is. God never answers Moses' question. He simply says, now is the time when you see what I will do to Pharaoh. Can, can I get my theory? I, I just, I thought about this a lot this week. <laughs> My theory is that if they had strolled into Egypt and God had given them immediate victory and success, they would have been incredibly prideful and they would not have relied upon the Lord. That God had to humble them through this experience and give them a taste of failure so that their dependence upon the Lord would be deeper. And and of course, I love John Piper has this quote. He says, God has 10,000 reasons for everything that he does and we might be aware of three of them. So that's my one of 10,000 reasons why God maybe did this. And I, and I think even of my reflections in, in, in this church and, and as I was praying about this and working through the spiritual depression, I went to this conference in Florida and I, and I remember one of the speakers who was talking about pastoring, he said, one of the worst things that God can do for some of you is to give you a church that grows because then you won't depend on him and rely on him. And I think, oh, that broke me. I was like, oh man. I think that would have been terrible for me because I, I wouldn't have been able to grow and be put in a place of, of seeing Christ as my ultimate treasure regardless of numbers, right? And, and I think in this situation, it would have been so easy for them to get puffed up of like, look how great we are when God's doing all the work. Where God says, let me humble you and show you how weak you are before I'm gonna deliver you. So that's my theory. In verse two, In response to Pharaoh's question, who is Yahweh? God says, I am Yahweh, the God who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, El Shaddai. Like, have you ever heard someone in church call God El Shaddai? It comes from Exodus 6.3. El Shaddai simply means God Almighty. Verse 3 does raise a lot of questions that people debate because we read, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Which doesn't make any sense because if you read Genesis, God repeatedly calls himself Yahweh to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So what's going on here? Some scholars think that God is saying that in the book of Exodus, he's going to more fully reveal the meaning of the name Yahweh. He's going to give a fuller revelation of that name. Other scholars think that verse 3 should actually be translated as a question. I'm not going to get too nerdy into the details of, of Hebrew, but just know in Hebrew, there are no question marks. So you kind of need to use the context to figure out if it is a question. And I'll just say verse three can be translated to say this, but by my name, Yahweh, did I not make myself known to them? And that would make way more sense. Oh yes, of course I made myself known in the past. So whichever view you take, and there's like 10 other views, I think it's vital to understand that in verses one through five, God does not tell Moses anything new in these verses. Everything in these verses was contained in Exodus 3 and 4 when Moses spoke to God in the burning bush. In verses 1 through 5, God is simply reminding Moses of all the promises that he has already spoken to Moses in this book. And this is why I, I use this phrase all the time that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. What do I mean by that? Because I feel like I use this phrase so often. I had someone finally say, Pastor, what, is that? what does that mean? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not being clear about what I mean. Let me tell you what I mean. I mean that in the same way that you would go to someone who does not know Jesus and you would tell them about the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus and how he can forgive you and make you clean and hold you fast. When you are tempted to despair, you need to share the good news of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, and grace, and forgiveness with your own soul. 
You need to remind yourself of all of Christ's promises and, and, and meditate on God's word and take it in. And in these verses, in response to Moses' lament, the Lord knows exactly the words Moses needs to hear. And they just happen to be all the promises that Moses already knew, but he simply needed to be reminded of. Remember my prayer for us this morning is that, is that we as God's people would be able to trust in God's promises even when it seems like we're losing. Because in Exodus 5, we find four responses. Pharaoh responded in pride. The people responded by complaining. Moses responded with lament. And the Lord responded by repeating his promises. So let me ask you, how do you feel this morning? Do you feel like we are losing or you are losing or Christians? And I mean, how do you feel? And when you're faced with this kind of opposition and, and, and turmoil, how are you going to respond? In pride like Pharaoh? With complaining and grumbling like the Israelites? Or in a prayer of faith and lament where you honestly go to God with your emotions and your pain and your questions? And let me ask you, do you meditate on the promises of God? Do you meditate on his words? Because I think there's one way in which we can say, I believe God's in control in our heads, but in our hearts we're, we're filled with anxiety and we're just driven mad because we're forgetting the simple promises and simple truths of the scriptures. Let me say this morning, I have three pastoral charges. I have three ways that we can take the truths of Exodus 5 and apply them to our lives. First pastoral charge, turn to the true and better mediator. Turn to the true and better mediator. If you turn from your sin and put your faith alone in Jesus, you can have the hope and peace and forgiveness of having a mediator who is better than Moses. And I hope you, you see, just as we've been reading the book of Exodus, that this is not me forcing my, my way to find Jesus. Or, or, or that I hope you'd remember that, that Moses understood that his whole life was meant to be a picture of a prophet greater than himself who would come later. The, the book of Exodus is all meant to be a way to point to Jesus. And even in Moses' simple example of being a mediator for the people is a picture of the mediator that we need in Christ. And so let me just urge you, if you have not had your sins forgiven, if, if you don't have that forgiveness, trust in Jesus, trust in his sacrifice and his resurrection and his ascension, and let him be the one to plead on your behalf. Second pastoral charge. Make the glory of God your ultimate goal. Make the glory of God your ultimate goal. I don't think the ultimate goal is more people showing up or more baptism or more people coming to Christ. Like those are good goals. Those are things we hope for and we strive to that end. But I think our ultimate goal has to be to seek to glorify God no matter what, no matter the cost, no matter the circumstances, no matter people's response, no matter his plan, seek to be faithful in whatever God ordains. If faithfulness means facing persecution and unbelief, glory to God. If, if, if faithfulness means preaching the gospel and taking care of a growing church and discipling new believers, glory to God. If faithfulness means for me as the pastor preaching the last funeral of the last member of this church and then closing the church, glory to God. There are some of you, I, I would just say, when it comes to that last example, that just terrifies you. And let me tell you what my old professor Mark Clifton says. How do you know if something is an idol? If you're afraid of losing it. That's how you know. It's so easy to confuse the bride of Christ for Christ. And I know because I do it often. Because church, listen to me. Don't let fear control you. Don't let fear lead you. Because it will only lead you deeper into idolatry. The only way that you can find real peace and contentment is if Christ himself is your peace. Like, like, not to freak you out, I have hope that God has a purpose for this church, has a purpose for Brant Lake, that there are dead sinners out there that God has planned to save. He will save by his mighty power. God is doing something in Brant Lake, and I'm excited about that future. But if God took this church away, would Christ still be your treasure? Would you still have your peace? And, and if you're afraid of losing this church, it's an idol that you need to work through in your heart with the Lord and make Christ your ultimate treasure. Make your ultimate goal in life to, to hear those simple words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Final pastoral charge, preach the gospel to yourself. 
Preach the gospel to yourself. In the words of Pastor John Piper, you never, 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 never outgrow your need for the gospel. Don't ever think of the gospel as that's the way you get saved and then you get strong by leaving it and doing something else. No, we are strengthened by God through the gospel every day until the day we drop. We are to receive that every day. When you get up in the morning, preach the gospel to yourself. Say, my sins are forgiven today. They're forgiven not because I'm somebody, but because Jesus was somebody. He died for me. He rose again. He reigns for me. He is interceding for me. He pleads his blood for me. He's sovereign over me. He sent the spirit to me by faith alone. You preach the gospel to yourself every morning and you receive it over and over and over again. And on that note, all the people said, Amen. let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, there's so many good gifts that you've given us, whether it be our, our families or our neighbors or our friends or even this church. But Lord, if our hope is in any of these things, it's fleeting and it will fail and disappoint us and lead us to discouragement. Lord, help us not to focus on, on the scores of this world and, and the way that we measure success and the way the world measures it. But Lord, help us to find our ultimate happiness and joy and peace in you so that when discouragement comes, we can still be like a rock that is weighed down, that you would be our anchor through all our trials. And Lord, we praise you forever for the blood of Christ and the promises that we have in him. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that, that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, if you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.